Hello and welcome to another podcast from Odell Technology. Today we're joined by Megan Morris Hart, the Director of Digital Innovation at Oxford University Hospitals and the Director of The Hill. Hello, Megan. Nice to see you again. Hello, Stephen. Lovely to see you too. All right, Megan, I wouldn't mind if you introduced yourself and told the audience a little bit about your professional life and how you ended up where you are today. Of course. Um, I am the Director of Digital Innovation for Oxford University Hospitals, and I direct a team called The Hill, which does brings digital technology into the National Health Service in the UK. Um, and does that by bringing companies from all over Europe and all over the world into that system. Um, as to how I got here, it's a little bit of an accident, I think, Stephen. So um, I started off as a chemist. I was recruited into an innovation agency as, as a, a chemist and worked with some, some very good scientists at Shell um, on, a, on a project and various other large blue chip companies. Um, was going to go on to do an academic career and then got a bit distracted, basically. Um, I think um, effectively got into innovation, realised that innovation has a really big impact on the real world and that the, I could see a stronger path to impact directly with the work that I was doing um, in the private sector rather than in academia and therefore decided to um, decided to pursue that career path um, and subsequently have managed a number of teams in that area. Okay, so how long have you been with um, Oxford University and when did the Hill start? So I've been at the Hill since 2018, end of 2018. Um, and that was when the Hill really started in its current format. So before then, it was a networking organisation aimed at bringing together people in the digital health community, but everyone was running it voluntarily. Um, then we managed to find some grant funding. And that was the point at which I came on as a, a full time member of staff or well, actually part time to begin with, because I, I just had my son. Um, and so I just come back from maternity leave, um, but soon ramped up to full time because it wasn't possible to, to do the job in less. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Now, how exactly does the Hill work? If I'm a, um, a digital startup or I'm a larger digital organisation and I want to approach you, how do I go about it? So people approach us in a variety of different ways, actually. Um, we have a, a simple triage form that people can just fill in either on our website or from having met one of the team at a conference or something like that, um, which then allows them to kind of directly enter our pipeline process and be triaged by a member of the team and, and try and understand what kind of interaction they'd like with us. Um, but where people come from, from, from filling in that form tends to be from personal interactions with a member of the team, um, from finding us on online, perhaps, or for, from applying for one of our programs, um, because we do a lot of startup support programs. And so things like our accelerator are a good, um, a good example of where people come and find us. So the accelerator program, tell me a bit more about that, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so that's our flagship program for startup companies. We take companies that have a prototype or a beta product or um, you know, something that's um, that's really got some of its clinical validation. We believe it to be safe and, and uh, effective, but perhaps hasn't yet managed to sell into the health service or to be used in the health service. Um, and we support the companies and the company founders to both develop the company itself and also to learn more about the UK's National Health Service as a market and about how they might interact with that market and how they might use their products within the NHS. And can you get a, can I, could you get a digital health application up to a specific standard? Could you help them meet the standards that they have to meet in order to enter the, the, the National Health Service? Yes, absolutely. So we work with quite a range of, of people with regulatory expertise who can help them understand kind of what sort of regulations are appropriate. And we also run pilot projects with some of the companies um, where we support them to do a service evaluation or a pilot within the healthcare setting to try and understand how their, how their, their product would work, um, you know, how it, how it might need to interface with the habits and practices of the people using it but also how they can make sure it meets the quality standards that it needs to, to, to be used in the service. Okay. And do you charge for this program or is there a grant available to take? So the accelerator is an equity-based accelerator. So we take a small amount of equity from each of the companies, um, which I think is very, 
very positive way of doing it, actually. I've um, run a number of accelerator programs in my career to date, and I think it really aligns incentives really well because it means that the whole of the Oxford University Hospitals team um, is aligned with the, the company team in, in making the innovation a success. So when someone has an innovation, do you look at the, 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 need, the, the unmet needs in the hospital at Oxford, at the, at the campus? Is that something that you would do? Yes, yeah. So you've hit the nail on the head there, Stephen. It's it's um a, a pretty much a year long process the recruitment to the accelerator, and in fact, we've just been over the summer starting to compile some of those needs, look at where there are particular opportunities to improve the services, um, and our applications for the accelerator will open now in the next month, and we'll be targeting companies that meet some of the needs of the service and where we know that there are clinical champions who are keen to explore something in that area. So you do inpatient and outpatient. Do you ever integrate with the community services at all? Is that something you've you've, you've started to look at as well? Yeah, that's a, a really good point, actually. Um, I think, you know, so traditionally in the UK, there's been a division between the way that primary care services, so those, your, your sort of general doctor that you might go to for um, an initial complaint, the community services, which deal with um, uh, adult social care, deal with... Uh, uh, areas of um, physio after operations and um, people who have long term conditions who need to be visited by nurses, you know, these sorts of things. And then the acute gen general hospitals, which will deal with um, operations, elective care and inpatient procedures and things like that. Um, these are all coming together, actually, into integrated care systems. Um, and yeah. the integrated care systems, the idea is that you build the care really around the patient and that you try and bring together all of those services for the for the benefit of the patient and make it as seamless as possible for them to So was that part of hospital at home? So hospital at home is a, is a very specific um, project that we've done within Oxford University Hospitals um, where we, it actually was um, popularised during COVID, um, where we took hospital level care and gave that to patients in their own homes. And so clinicians from the hospital were going out to people's homes to treat them using a variety of, um, of equipment like sort of portable ultrasound machines, for example, to be able to give some of the diagnostic tests that you might otherwise get in a hospital setting. And that is absolutely made possible because of that connection between the community services and the hospital services, and because you all need to collaborate together to make sure that you can gain access to the patient and that they're supported in their home in the right way. Okay, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. That's a wonderful thing. Tell me, have you got any real world examples of um, a, a lovely little digital startup that's come to you and has been incorporated into your organization? Yeah, so actually we're, we're just doing a, a pilot with a company called Concentric at the moment, which is a digital consent solution. And they came through our accelerator two years ago um, and they got the interest from the ophthalmology department to do a pilot of their solution, looking at consenting patients at home. So this is, um, one of those innovations that I would I would put in the in the category of being, um, uh, you know, kind of improving the efficiency and operations of the hospital, and improving patient experience because it, it connects directly with the patient and and enables them to give consent for procedures. And that innovation is really interesting actually because um, it provides a range of information in the form of videos and text and and other sort of multimedia to the patient allows them to peruse that material for as long as they would like to, and then provide consent online to a procedure. Now, what we're finding from the hospital side is that that massively speeds up the consent process. And it means that the patients are better informed because they haven't had to make a decision based upon a five to 10 minute conversation with a clinician. Instead, they've been able to go back over the material, discuss it with their relatives, um, you know, maybe ask some questions of the team before they consent. And from a clinical perspective, they've reduced the time taken to take a consent from about 15 minutes down to one minute, which, and you can imagine that all of that time is then spent um, improving patient care in other areas. So it's, it's been a, it's so far the, the early results of that pilot are extremely successful. And in fact, we're looking to roll out the solution across the rest of the trust. That's interesting. So how do you measure success? Do you attach these outcomes to a registry? Is there some way that you can quantify success? Different mm. uh, well, in common with most impact organizations across the world, we um, we spend quite a bit of time thinking about what exactly is our impact and how can we measure it. 
we've, we've got a range of different metrics for the hill as a whole. For projects like that, we set up um, specific targets that we have for the project or for the pilot. Um, so things like looking at time to consent. Um, so how much time is spent upon a consenting procedure would be one of those for that particular project. But those can range from um, patient outcome measures. So thinking about the clinical outcomes of patients through to patient experience measures. So the satisfaction surveys with patients, um, staff well-being measures. So um, we're doing an, another pilot at the moment. We're just setting up is with a, a well-being service. And there we'll be looking more at um, staff sickness levels um, the amount to which they feel supported, the staff survey and, and kind of their positive or negative responses to a staff survey, you know, these sorts of things. So quite a range of different measures. Um, we also have a lot of, of what I might call input measures as well, or, or output measures, which are more around how many people attend our programmes, how much investment is raised by the companies we support, how many competitions have they won, these sorts of things, you know. And what about cost effectiveness? How would you measure that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it's very much around trying to cost how much whatever it is you're trying to do takes at the moment and then what's the cost of bringing in the solution. Um, so another example that we've dealt with recently and, and we're looking, we're exploring the, the financial model for um, is diabetes testing for pregnant women. So at the moment, a nurse um, runs a clinic for pregnant women who come in and get a gestational diabetes test. That obviously takes a certain amount of time from the nurse. And there's also aspects such as the journey of the patient into the hospital, how many um, people don't attend for those appointments and therefore go on to have complications in their pregnancy. Um, so all sorts of different factors there. Um, the way we've been looking at the, the alternative, which is a home testing kit for the patient, um, which is arguably more expensive per test in terms of the actual materials and the test itself. Um, but we've been looking at the cost effectiveness of freeing up that nurse time to then spend time with the patient. So that's one kind of cost that, that we can net off against the cost of the materials. And then the other thing being, um, how much does it save to not have those complications in childbirth? So how you know, if you have fewer complications further down the line, how do you cost in the um the improved outcomes that you get overall across the population into that equation and it can get quite complex i have to say i have no doubt the modeling would be very complex do you do the modeling in-house or do you ask the the app developer to do that for you it varies actually um so the companies will get involved with with developing those sorts of models and um, we also work with our academic health science networks um and with nihr funded research institutes with other academic groups so a variety of different partners depending upon the exact project and the type of modeling that we're looking to do i think one of the big challenges with um with innovation in general and one of the major opportunities of innovation within the health service is sharing of best practice because fundamentally there's an awful lot of good things going on in hospitals across the world already. And the more we can learn from other people and the more we can bring in technologies which work for other institutions, the better we, we will be. Um, I think that's particularly true for other institutions within the National Health Service because they naturally have um, some similar processes to us. They might have a similar way of doing things and treat similar patients. And therefore there's a good likelihood that if it works for someone else, it'll work for us. Um, and in fact, we do find that um, innovators who come into the National Health Service, once they've got a pilot in one place and they've, they've, they've sort of proved the model within the NHS, it's then much easier to scale and spread that because people understand that they've tried it in an environment that's similar, that the results are good and that there's a good likelihood it will work for them. One of the ways that I do that, in fact, is I run an innovation exchange group with a number of other acute trusts. And we actually get together once a quarter and we discuss some of the projects that have been fantastic for us. Um, and we have that sort of informal network that allows us to share best practice in that way. Um, and that's one of a number of different networks across the NHS, which will share that sort of best practice. That's fantastic. I wasn't aware of that. That's very exciting. OK, so if people want to make contact with you, how do they do it? So probably the best way is going onto our website. It's www.thehilloxford.org. Um, or you can drop any of us an, an email. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter or X, depending on what you call it these days. I'm very pleased to join these things. because I think it's some, something positive in the NHS. 
and people I don't think are, a lot of people probably aren't aware of. It. So I think that the more people that are aware of your good of the good work that's being done at, at your, at, within your organisation and within Oxford, I think the better for everyone. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. Thank you ever so much, Stephen.